Hey Mel, can you help me with a little project? Like what? I need you to freeze your mom. Wait, what? Yeah, what? No, it's for a board game skit. I'm gonna make it look like you're freezing your mom with ice powers, you know, like Elsa. Yes, 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 yes. No, 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 no. Every time you decide to do one of these skits, it takes you hours to set up the lights and hours of filming. Not to mention the endless editing. You always come to bed at the some ungodly hour of the night saying, don't let me do that again. Your parents are coming over this weekend. We've got to clean the litter boxes, get the kitchen all cleaned up, the grass needs cut, the old car doesn't run, and you know you Dad wants to You want me to freeze her it. now? There's board games all over the place. Hey there everyone, I am Jeff, your tabletop technician here in the Dice Tower, and yeah, I was hoping to do some fancy intro with some special Hold effects, on. but honestly... So we're not doing this now. No, sweetie, your mom is right. Look, those shots take a lot. Right. Well, anyways, I'd better get to the game here, because today I'm quite excited to tell you a bit about Queen by Midnight. I didn't know this game existed until a friend of a friend took us all by the Darrington Press booth at Gen Con as he wanted to learn a little more about the game. While there, I learned that it was a deck building brawler game with a fairly impressive table presence, including this combination central clock round tracker and dice tower. Just a month or so later, I was walking through the main hall at the Dice Tower Retreat when I saw Queen by Midnight sitting on a table with an open seat. I took it, and a reasonable amount of time later, arose from the table, victorious. And now I have this copy, provided by Darrington Press, and I think I'm going to start here by simply opening it up. <laughs> Worth it. At first, you'll come across these six unique player boards, each representing a different adult princess with a variety of fantasy themes. Right off the bat, this sets the stage for this uniquely themed game. While a number of these characters clearly appear to be inspired by established animated pop culture icons, Queen by Midnight makes it clear early on that it's taking a grown-up approach to the idea of princesses vying for the throne. And that theme intensifies with the next item in this box, the dark, somewhat gothic centerpiece display. I know, I know, this thing reeks of gimmick, but it is indeed functional. The hour hand points to the current round. I already mentioned that it also serves as a dice tower, though dice may or may not be used in all playthroughs of the game. In addition, it contains reminders of what happens on specific rounds, and it holds the common market of cards you can purchase throughout the game. In fact, the only gimmicky part of this thing is that it spins on a cardboard base that doesn't actually stay put on any table surface in the first place. Regardless, I think this piece is pretty unique, but it's not the only trick up this game's sleeves. Each player gets their princess's player board, along with a tracker placed along the top for their health and clout, which is an unnecessarily fancy word for money. These player boards establish which two of the three different types of combat, brawler, schemer, and caster, are available to your character. You'll have a major and minor value of your two combat types printed on your board, which various cards will reference throughout the game. This board also provides places to store a variety of stacks of cards, and you'll see that there's quite a few of them, like your deck, your war chest, your archive, your vault deck, and your vault. See, I already mentioned that there's a common market of cards called the Bazaar stored here on the central display, and players can only purchase cards that feature one of the combat types of their requisite princess. But this vault provides a secondary market of cards available to you and you alone. And not only that, but these cards are purpose-built for your princess, meaning that they provide guaranteed options to build up your character and your engine without having to rely on the right common cards being available when you need them. These vault cards provide asymmetry without having to bog players down in a lot of unique rules. You don't have to teach a different game to each different player, at least for the most part. And I think this system is fascinating. It blurs the lines between a deck building game and a living card game. And ultimately your deck and your princess are going to be a blend of those two systems. 
Adding more progression to the game is the fact that the Bizarre cards are divided into Afternoon, Evening, and Twilight cards, with Afternoon cards focusing more on defense and ways to get clout money, in case you missed it, while Twilight cards are a bit more about laying down damage and pushing for the endgame. These cards swap out when the clock here strikes a particular hour, as noted here on the central display. Not only that, but at certain hours of the game, players may get some extra clout, they may get a permanent increase to their hand size, and towards the end of the game, they'll eventually gain access to their war chest. These three cards are again custom tailored to each princess's asymmetric abilities, and they can create some powerful combos if you manage to get them into your hand quick enough after the clock strikes eight. In addition, one of these cards is deemed the ultimate. It's a very expensive and very powerful card, not the least of which because the rules specifically state that the attack generated by these cards cannot be negated or blocked in any way. Okay, so if you're familiar with my videos here on the channel, you might have noticed by now that I'm not following my normal routine of telling you how to play the game and then telling you what I think about the game. And that's a bit on purpose. You see, there's not a lot of value in teaching you how to play this game. It's a deck builder. Everyone starts off with the same 10 cards, pretty much all of which just give you money, and there's one that gives you a way to banish or get rid of an unwanted card from your deck. Beyond that, you're paying to buy cards, and in this game, you pay to play them, which ironically, we didn't do correctly during my first play through at the retreat. There is, however, a decent variety of cards, some that give you money, sorry, clout, or deal damage, or heal damage, or maybe even let you summon a character that can assist you in some way, albeit without any art depicting said character. But other than that, it's another deck building game, not too dissimilar from, well, any of these. Now, I do like the flexibility added here by the dual markets. I also really like this central display gimmick and all. I like the war chest cards. They give you opportunities to create some really powerful combos. There is also this spot beneath your board called the armory for three other types of cards, boons, banes, and reactions. Boons are an ongoing positive effect, like generating a constant source of income or letting you draw extra cards. Banes are the exact opposite. They're meant to slow you down and are usually placed there by an opponent. Reactions are stored down here as well, face down and for free, but you can play them later as a reaction to an action by another player, provided you can afford to play them at that moment. And they are usually a way to negate some incoming damage or even cancel an attempted at attack altogether. Now I'll talk about this more in a moment, but lastly, there's also some nice fringe rules, like being able to spend two clout to refresh either of your two available markets. That's not to say, though, that everything is pristine in this torrent land of dark dueling royalty. For starters, as far as deck builders go, it's far easier to get cards into your deck than it is to get rid of them. I mentioned that you had one card that lets you banish cards from the game, and some cards, like your starting currency cards, allow themselves to be banished when played. But further opportunities to groom your deck are a little sparse. And to make things even more difficult, unlike most deck builders, you must play a card in order to discard it from your hand. You cannot just voluntarily discard a card, nor do you discard your remaining hand at the end of your turn. This means that you could potentially get yourself to a point where you can't afford to play any card in your hand, but can't free up room in your hand to draw a card that might provide some much needed currency. Also, since a lot of these cards, especially the ones in your vault, are designed to synergize with each other, it's fairly easy to bloat your deck to the point that you never quite get the right cards together at the right time. And so you might find yourself taking simple pop shots at opponents for little more than two or three damage at a time. And this brings up another unique challenge with this game, courtesy of these reaction cards I've just mentioned. Some of these characters have more of these than others in their vault deck, and if left unchecked long enough, a player could collect a number of them here in their armory, making it very difficult to deal any real damage to them. And as a result, they almost kind of become invincible, as a player will look at their play area and decide that they're not really worth the effort. Therefore, focusing their attention on someone else, which is much more likely to be you. But I do think there's one other point in the middle of this game that just gets weird. When the clock strikes six, players are forced to make a rather odd decision. What's the worst possible design element in combat games? Everyone say it with me, player elimination. There's nothing more awkward than investing your time into a game only to be told, gee, sorry, you didn't do too well, did you? But uh, hey, why don't you go find something else to do and we'll wrap this up without you. 
As a way of getting around this modern board gaming no-no, Queen by Midnight incorporates a rather unusual fealty system. When the clock strikes six before any turns are taken, each player will use a personal deck of cards to secretly choose which character they think might win the game. If a player is later eliminated from the game, Everything that they've built, acquired, and everything that they've done is wiped away and replaced with a single card, which gives them a short list of actions, one of which they can choose to take on any of their remaining turns, and all of which are aimed at helping the character they chose at the six o'clock round. If that character wins, then their assisting player wins too. I'm not entirely sure if this system is any less awkward than just getting up and leaving the table in the event that you're knocked out of the game. The few actions available feel very underwhelming and require no real strategic or tactical planning. So you just sit there during everyone else's turn and wait for the moment to go, oh, um, do that one, I guess. Not to mention, you could find yourself lassoed to the player who took you out of the game in the first place, and it can feel truly off-putting to then be forced to support that player with nothing more than a promise of an awkward shared victory. Queen by Midnight in general stands at this challenging crossroads of unique ideas and questionable execution. Its production quality is spot on, its solution to player elimination is perhaps a bit uncomfortable. Its blend of deck building and living card game elements creates ample replayability while also creating opportunity for wildly imbalanced play. And I didn't even mention some of these cards that add push your luck elements by requiring dice rolls with a variety of positive and negative effects for the card's owner. I also haven't talked about this game's ending. On the climactic front, a player can take out their final opponents, claiming an instant victory as the last player standing. Or you could just run out the clock, hiding behind boon or reaction cards, and claim victory by being the player with the most combined total of health and money when the clock strikes midnight. And this is weird, right? Claiming victory even if you're clinging to your last point of health just because you have an ample wallet? And I think that really sums up my experience with Queen by Midnight. I've had tense games of this that end with the triumphant blast of an ultimate card, leaving one princess standing tall over the broken bodies of fallen royals. But I've also had games end with several princesses just sauntering off the battlefield, lazily counting their pennies to see who gets the new gig. And that means that this game has a wide range of options and outcomes, but that range extends from intense and exciting to boring and unfulfilling. Of course, with experience over multiple plays, you and your friends will likely learn how to extract the finest flavors from this formula, but it could be a bumpy road to get there. And the other last thing I'd like to mention, by the way, the box states that this is a three to six player game. But the only reason I can guess why two players isn't an option is that you could possibly end up with one of the three damage types not being utilized in your game, which would render roughly a third of the cards in the common market as useless. Now, of course, you could just choose opposing princesses, or you could remove those cards from your playthrough, and I feel like that would have been an easy addition to the game, and then heck, the whole allegiance system could just be left out. Anyways, I do think that this is a pretty interesting game, and I have enjoyed most of my playthroughs with it, though Oddly enough, I think my most favorite game of this was when we thought playing cards was free, which might have been because the rulebook here leaves quite a bit to be desired. As a result of all of this, I'm gonna give this game a 6.5. I think it's full of opportunity, but lacks quite a bit of polish to be able to be recommended. Then again, I shouldn't assume to know for whom the bell tolls. Perhaps it tolls for thee. Cheers.